Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to an old friend who I've known for 20 years. He's a man who sells out theatres around the country, and I'm delighted to talk to Roy Chubby Brown. How are you? Hello, Alex. And how are you these days? I'm delicious, as you can see. All right. Well, I'm a bit on the heavy side, and the other side isn't so light either. <laughs> Are you one of those size zero types? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, extra large, you know. I mean, it's, uh, women think they're getting more if they see that on your shirt. Extra large. <laughs> <laughs> there is less of you. I mean, have you been on some regime or diet? I've got to say, I think it comes with age. You know, I'm 70 now, you know. It's been around since Captain Cook was a sea cadet. I've always been trying. You know, I've been torn between the fact that I am chubby brown and secondly... People saying, oh, you'll have to lose a bit of weight, you're not going to live very long, or, you know, and everything that goes with it. There's nobody been on my, more diets than me, I've been on everything. Cabbage soup, bananas, <laughs> everything. Did the Atkins work for you? That's a good one, no carbs. They, I tried that, but I sort of took to bacon sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have the bread with it. The bacon's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, you've got to have bread with the bacon. You can't just have bacon on its own. I wrote to them, I threatened them. Now, the gym. We talked about the gym last time. I know you like swimming, don't you? That must be a sight. Uh, well, I go down every morning. Well, when I can, I, I, I tell a bit of a fib there, three or four times a week at least. And what I've started to do now, because it's good for your, your knees and it takes your weight, I run up and down in the pool for about 30 lengths, and that keeps me ticker going, you know. And then I go straight in the cafe and have a bacon <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> Fat bastard. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do the chanting tonight. I mean, that is your name. As slim as you are now, I mean, you're yeah. wasting away to nothing. Nymph-like, dare I say. Um, we get a bit of chanting, don't we, about the you fat bastard? You will all the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she's not with me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the hecklers who don't quite come fully equipped with a full shilling, you have to put those in their place, they, don't they you? They will be told. They will be told. And I've thought of a few today. <laughs> Yes, I have, yes. Are they almost infinite? Because you've always got an answer for everything. I guess you have to have, because that's the act, isn't it? You can't be outwitted. No, well, you were, they could make you look foolish, couldn't they? You know, you, you were supposed to be... You're, you're the one that paying to see. If somebody else is funnier than you in the audience, you've, you know... So I carry a gun <laughs> with a telescopic sight. If Just the bouncers the... can't shift them, I will. <laughs> Is it fun being you? I mean, you've been around so long and you've defied your critics in a sense that you're still selling out and you've got a major audience. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because very few people give you credit professionally for being one of the biggest selling artists in live theatre. Um, as you know, when you're controversial, as I am, I mean, a lot of this political correctness has ruined a lot of comedians. They don't work anymore now because, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm of the opinion, the day we stop poking fun at each other, and we'll lose that 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 uh, that humour, the the street humour, the working class humour. If we, you know, we, there's no harm in it. And I always say, you don't go and see a violent movie and then come out and kick somebody in the goalies, do you? I mean, you you know, you you leave it behind. It's the same with me. You come in the room, we have a good time, we're having a party. You know, if you want to dress up. Uh, whatever you want to do and then you, you, as soon as you go out of the place you go back to your natural reality you've got a tax bill and a phone bill and a gas bill you've got a insure with a car you go back to reality when you're with me we we, we live on Fantasy Island and we're saying things that no, I say things that other people wouldn't normally say and that's that's why they pay to see me of all the people I've interviewed over the years, you're one of the most popular on my channel. You have thousands of hits. People are very interested. Also, privately, you're one of the people I have to defend the most because I don't think people quite get that it's an act and that you're a really talented pianist, for example. I said pianist. And that you're a clever comedian. I mean, you're continually rewriting, rewriting, adding, putting in, doing a show, throwing it in the bin and starting again. I couldn't be, I couldn't be one of them who told the same joke for 30 years. You know, I'm a, I know the old... Music all comics used to do that. They'd have an act and that was it. And they would never change it. I couldn't be like that. I'd, I'd be bored to death. I have to, every morning I get the papers and I have a look and see. So, I mean, some days I can't think of a thing, I have to be honest. And other days I can write four or five sheets of script. And then, because I have no inhibitions, I have no barriers, I have to censor myself. So I just carry on with it. You know, it's it's what the old wives used to say. At least Chubby calls a spade a spade. You know, and that's all he is to it. <laughs> Are there some jokes you've written and done that you wish you hadn't in hindsight? Well, I do get the blame for a lot of uh, things. I mean, 
there was things said years ago, wasn't it, about the Bradford fire? And they said, uh, Chubby Brown said that. I never said no such thing. I mean, I'm, I might be controversial. I might be filthy. I might be rude. I might be obnoxious at times. But the, 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 my last line there is, I would never ruin my career. I've got a wife and family. I've got children, our grandchildren now. Do you think I'll put them through purgatory just because I said something, you know? I mean, there's, I know thousands of jokes about paedophiles, but I don't crack them because it's not my, that's not my barra. That's not my level. I mean, mine, are, mine are dirty, filthy jokes, I think, but, but they're not, you know, they're not, um, I don't scrape the bottom of the barrel. If you, and I do think about what I'm saying. I always admired Joan Rivers. She always said she'd never apologise for a joke and refused to do so. Do you have that policy as well? Because you are a comedian. I think people forget that. You are making jokes. Uh, some reporter said, and it was only a couple of years ago, I would never see you. You, you. You're very racist. I said, listen, I raise money for blind dogs. When they train that dog, I don't tell them who to give that dog to. I don't so... Give it, don't give it to him, he's a different colour to me. That, that's just ridiculous, you know. Uh, and, and some people say, uh, well, e- even last time I was here at Leicester, at the stage door, we had loads of uh, Asians outside. Did you leave us alone tonight, Chubby? I said, I'm, I'm, I might be controversial, but I'm not an idiot. I, I, I don't want the papers to say tomorrow. Chubby Brown found headless in the back of taxi. <laughs> no, that's one headline you don't want to cover. Yeah. We are here at the Athena today, which is a great venue because it's sort of a cabaret room. Is it difficult doing a place that's as diverse as Leicester? Does it make any difference or is your act your act? Well, I always ask the owners, I say, is it all right to see And they said, say what you like. They've come to see you. They haven't paid £20 to see me. They've come to see you, you know. If I was that important, the seats would be facing me. They're not the facing you. <laughs> it's up to you if you want to take a chance, you know. This is why I come on in a suit of armour. <laughs> uh, yeah. The last time we spoke, you got your new DVD out for Christmas. And at the same time, you'd done this documentary about yourself. And I'd recorded one with you back in 2005 or six, I think it was, for Channel 4. And people are fascinated by you. And I see at the stage door, I mean, there is literally everyone, men, women, black, white, all different colours, age groups. Um, you seem to have had a resurgence in recent years as well. Do you think that's to do with the sort of political times we're going through? Because it is controversial at the moment. People do have opinions. The UKIPs are rising. It's sort of made what you do relevant well I'm not religious and I'm not political I'm a joke teller and as I look back over the years I say let's go back two years ago I thought well I've had 40 odd years at this job I'm not filling theatres anymore the uh, people haven't got the money they've got other things to spend the money on maybe I'm coming the end of my career then suddenly it was as if the word got round oh Chubby Brown gives tenors away and I haven't been to a theatre in the last year that hasn't been packed at the door. So what's happened there? Unless they're just waiting for me to turn me back. <laughs> <laughs> or drop down live on yeah, stage, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, get him. yeah. He'll turn on in a minute, we'll get him. Yeah. Is but, it still thrilling when you walk out there and get that ovation? Because, I mean, you make sure you start the show like a rock concert, don't you? And, and there's, a, there's a certain yeah. aura about you when you walk on. I don't... Uh, I've never, ever took a drug in my life. Only anodine, right? And I've never been that drunk that I fell over but there can't be a bigger high than standing on stage and a thousand people laughing at something you wrote that day whatever it was now last week we had a plane that went over a motorway and the wing hit a taxi and it landed in the river and that night I walked on and said could you imagine that taxi driver going home and saying to his wife, you should have seen the size of the tip I got today. <laughs> See, and it was fresh. And people in the room started clapping after, you know, that for me, an up-to-date, you know, if you can relate, relate to that, an up-to-date gag, an up-to-date line that people think, you know, people are sat there thinking, I wish I had thought of that. And it's terrifying though, isn't it? Because when you're doing that topical stuff, there's a possibility it might not get a laugh. Do you worry about that? Were you there last night? <laughs> The audience last night, I cracked some gags last night that was in the news, and I said, I had to say to the audience, can I ask you something, ladies and gentlemen? Do you read the paper? (laughs) (laughs) There's never two nights the same. There's never two nights the same. In fact, the last time I was here, I was halfway through a great gag, and there was a power cut. (laughs) Uh, So I don't know how that one went. (laughs) 
What do you do to stand there and shout? Is that the only way out? We all started laughing. Yeah. <laughs> I just went the microphone and went... <laughs> <laughs> the persona you have and the costume, let's call it that, the Roy Chubby Brown costume, did that happen by accident? Because it's iconic and synonymous to you, isn't it? Yeah. In the 60s, the late 60s, you used to go along to a venue. It didn't matter how good you were on stage, good, bad or indifferent. At the end of the night, they'd say, who was on? And they'd say, uh, oh, somebody called Ted on the drums and somebody called Alan played the guitar. So I actually said at the time, we need a name. We need a name that people go home and they can uh, they take the mick out of. So I had been reading a magazine that day about the two flyers that flew the Atlantic, uh, all cock and brown. I said, let's call ourselves all cock and brown. And if I had a pound for every time I heard that gag, we thought Sammy Davis Jr. was on. <laughs> you know? So you, you see where I'm coming from. And also, there was three of us. So you'd turn up at a venue and they'd say, who are you? And we'd say, all cock and brown. But there's three of you. And I say, yeah, it's Mr. All, Mr. Cock and Mr. Brown. And he used to say, do you mean we're getting three of you for the price of two? It's all psychology, isn't it? And, you, you know, over the years, we've had, to, we've had to think like that. The music is such a big part of your life privately and professionally. Um, you make it part of the show now. I've said to you many times, I think you should come on as you and actually just play the piano because you're stunning. I just heard you in rehearsals. You're amazing at it. And it's a great passion of yours, isn't it? I was about... 38, 38 year old, went to see a, a movie, uh, The Sting, and this music came on, and I asked you, the friend I was with, I said, what's that music? He said, it's called Ragtime Piano, but I was a drummer, and I played a bit of uh, ukulele banjo, and, and I went to Walker's Sale Rooms, and I bought an old piano, five pound, it was miles out of tune, I didn't know. <laughs> and went home and the poor bloke in the flat below me must have been going mad because I would sit there for hours going dum da dum da dum da dum da dum and uh, about 11 years later I have several tunes off and I just I, I took to it I, cu I couldn't get away with jazz and blues I love it don't get me wrong when it's played right but I was a, sort of a, a person who looks for melodies and since then since round about 86, 87, I've written about 150 songs uh, and the songs are like poems aren't they, they're sort of personal you either like them or you don't and then when I was giving me songs to these music companies because it was me they were expecting a lot of effing and jeffing and they didn't realise I could write a song and just at the moment I've, uh, I've started to do a thing for Zoe's Place which is a hostel for terminally ill children so I've written a song called Zoe's Place and we're in the studios this week as we speak. And hopefully within the next month, it'll be out. And uh, that money is going to the hospice, you know, because I've paid my phone bill. The last time we spoke was, I think, 2010. And it was the day after Bernard Manning had died. And I'd done an interview with him and fell in love with him as a person. And I know you were a big fan. And there's a fascinating story, isn't there? Because he'd phoned you shortly before he passed away. Well, I, I, I'd actually gone away that, the, that on the morning. And he rang my house, you Hey, where are you? You know. And he left me a message. And he died that day. And of course, it was in all the papers. And I came home two days later. And he was on my answer phone. So it was a bit of a choker for me. So I rang BT and said, can you actually put this message on a CD for me? And they did. And I have that CD at home. Roy, I loved seeing you. And thank you so much for your time. You're one of our greatest acts. And regardless of the content of your show, as a human being, I think you're to be admired. What you do for charity privately um, it is only to be admired. The money you raise is wonderful. And the joy you've given people, whether the Toffee knows people in London think it's right or not, is not really the point, is it? Well, uh, if people don't believe what I have to say, you can always go on the Chubby Brown website, chubbybrown.biz, and you'll see we give... Uh, the cancer research people, £5,000 a few weeks ago, they were absolutely delighted. And what I have to say to you, Alex, is it was the audience's money. I buy the, the material, obviously, and then sell it to them, and that money goes to them. And the delight you see in those people's faces. And we've done all sorts, and like millions of other people, we'd, we'd only, we know the government pays 75% of all these registered charities, but they have to find a little bit for themselves. And... Um, uh, you know, I'll continue to do that. I, I'm giving them a little bit back for saving my life. That's what I'm doing. And again, how are you? I always ask you this question. I should have asked it right at the start, really. But how are you doing? How are you feeling? How's your health? I've, uh, I'm, I'm fine. But just this week got a bit of cold, a bit of a sore throat. Um, 
big coffin as you do, you know, sucking on them uh, lockets and. Uh, as long as that's what you're sucking yeah, on. Yeah, it's a d- <laughs> different name. You might know it by a different name, but I've, you know, hot drinks and uh, worrying whether I'll get through the show. Talking like Louis Armstrong. Brendan, it was lovely talking to you. Right, Chubby Brown, thank you for your time. Anytime, man. Bye.